By the way, this is these are, these numbers are good, Caddy. Which number? Yeah, it's jumping up. That's for sure. We have ninety-seven people just signed in. Oh, great! Well, yeah. that's that's about how many we'd get, Alan, if, if we were in the store, right? Yeah, uh, I yeah. think at, at most, right? I mean, because it's mm -hmm. yeah. the, the numbers are going up. Yeah, Where are you we'll, we'll top a hundred. All right. So, hello and welcome to PMP Live. I'm Alan Watke, Deputy Director of Events at Politics and Pros. Thank you for joining us tonight with, uh, with Cotty Martin celebrating her newest book, The Chancellor. At any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat that I'll throw in there um, to purchase a copy of The Chancellor on the Politics and Pros website. And you'll be able to ask Cotty a question by clicking on the Q&A link, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll get to the audience questions towards the end of the event. Um, and we will try to get to all of your questions, but apologize if we do run out of time. Also tonight, we do have the closed captions option, which is available. There's a link for that right next to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And finally, we just want to thank you all for being here with us today. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers keeping PMP afloat. And now I'd like to welcome to PMP Live, Cotty Martin, celebrating the release of her newest book, The Chancellor, The Remarkable Odyssey of Angela Merkel, the definitive biography of German Chancellor Angela Merkel, detailing the remarkable rise and political brilliance of the most powerful and elusive woman in the world. <laughs> Cotty Martin is the author of True Believer, um, Stalin's American Spy, Enemies of the People, My Family's Journey to America, which is a National Book Critics Circle Awards finalist, The Great Escape, Hidden Power, and a few other books. So we're really excited to bring her here for this. She is an award-winning former NPR and ABC News correspondent, and she lives in New York City. But even though we're virtual, she's here in DC right now. She's gonna come in tomorrow to sign some books. So we're very excited about that. Cotty will be joined in conversation tonight with Peter Bergen, Vice President at New America here in DC, as well as National Security Analyst for CNN, um, where he writes a weekly online column. He is a professor and co-director of the Center on the Future of War at Arizona State University. And Bergen is the author of five previous books um, about national security, including three New York Times bestsellers and four Washington Post nonfiction books of the year. And so without further ado, please join to PMP Live, Cotty Martin and Peter Bergen. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Alan. Thanks so much for, for having us. Uh, it's, it's a delight to be back at my favorite bookstore, uh, Politics and Prose, even, even in this somewhat limited way, as you can see from my very uh, unexciting backdrop. I am in a hotel. Um, I'd rather be with with all of you in our beloved politics and prose. But no complaints. I'm I'm delighted to be with you, and I'm delighted to be in conversation with my much admired friend and uh, and fellow scribe Peter Bergen. Uh, no one better to have a conversation with on on uh, regarding Chancellor Merkel or pretty much anything else in, in, in the realm of uh, history and geopolitics. So thank you, Peter, for giving me an evening. Um, it's, great to, it's great to see you even virtually. Well, Katty, thanks. And you know, one of the advantages of being online is we're joined by somebody from New Zealand uh, who's just joined us on the chat. Wow. Uh, now have 124 people, mm. uh, so, which I don't think PMP would be able to uh, fit in that geographical location. So. So, Kelly, uh, this is uh, your 10th book, uh, and it's received uh, some rave reviews. Uh, mm -hmm. As we've discussed, um, it's very unusual to get a hat trick in the New York Times, where you have Michelle Goldberg calling it captivating. The new book, you have Dwight Garner giving it a favorable review in the Daily Newspaper, and then uh, a real unbelievable rave review by Jacob Hallibrand 
in the uh, New York Times book review. So congratulations on all that. Um, and Caddy, if you want to just make just some scene setting kind of uh, observations about the book, then we can get into the Q and A, and then I'll moderate. Right. Okay. But, okay. But please jump in because the problem is that once I start talking about Merkel in the book, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I kind of lose control. But anyway, so stop me. But um, but Peter, this was um, this this was really the the of, of those ten books by far the toughest because she is the most private public person I would say in the planet, uh, on the planet, <laughs> and she, she did not want this or any other book of this sort written about her, that is to say a book that isn't strictly about what she does as chancellor. And I was writing uh, for the world, that sounds grandiose, but not, not just for, for um, a, a German audience. Um, and I'm happy to report that it's being translated into 15 languages. So, wow. so it is becoming an international um, a book and and therefore it's <clears throat> it's really about the human story of how it is that this triple outsider so a woman in a male political culture which germany was until merkel 16 years ago uh, a scientist she was a physicist and from the east uh, who the first time she crossed from east germany to west was at the ripe age of 35. And that's when she uh, plunged into politics and, and, and began her remarkable ascent. And until, until uh, 2015, I would say, I, um, my, my editor at Simon & Schuster, uh, the, the legendary Alice Mayhew, uh, had been saying, Kati, it's, it, it's, it's time for you to write a full biography of a woman. I'd not done that mm. and 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 Merkel think about Merkel and I thought well Merkel she seems like a fairly uh you know boring unexciting you know I'm not that passionate about German politics Germans themselves are bored by their own politics which is a sign of its success boring mm. is good after what what they did in the last century um, so, and then came 2015 and, um, and I thought observing how she allowed 1 million Middle Eastern, uh, Islamic refugees into this previously homogeneous country of Germany, uh, at a time when everybody else was, was unschooling barbed wire. I thought, wow, this, there's so much more here than uh, than this this rather uh, 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 boring facade that she projects to the world. So that's when I started. So it was five years of of, uh, of rigorous research. And so, I mean, a couple of questions about about that point. So I guess the conventional wisdom of the time is that she'd be paying tremendous political costs for making this decision. And did those come to pass? And relatedly, the the AFD uh, obviously kind of I don't know if these things exactly correlated, but the rise of the AFD was that uh, did that precede her decision to let in the million refugees, or was it sort of contemporaneous? The AFD we can credit Merkel sadly with the with the presence of the Alternative für Deutschland, the first far right party in the German Bundestag, the German parliament, we can credit her with that. Mm -hmm. um, that too is a, is a product of the Merkel era. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's also clear that the AFD is not rising. In fact, it's dropping in support and, uh, and COVID um, which has exposed um, so many populist movements for for the 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 empty suits that they are all all rhetoric and and no concrete planning um, has has uh, has dropped in the polls but it is sitting there in in the Bundestag and it's a direct result of uh, of of her uh, policy her generous policy of uh, what the Germans call the Willkommenskultur, but but on the way way heavily uh, weighted on the plus side is that this has been a transformational policy for Germany, 
and, and which was, of course, the economic and financial powerhouse of Europe. But under Merkel, it has also become the moral center of Europe, and perhaps we can say even of the world, because I, I, I can't really think of anyone else who's vying for that title at the moment, well, which is astonishing. Yeah, two related questions. I mean, as you well know, uh, being Hungarian originally, you know, Viktor Orban you know, has done pretty well and he didn't take anybody <laughs> or, or tried his best to exclude people. And you look at, at Poland with the, the rise of their right wing parties and even even in the UK with the sort of Brexit and the British National Party. I mean, was this sort of in the zeitgeist anyway and the refugee issue kind of just made it stronger or, or was this really just really about this decision? Yeah, and and Peter, if I may, you 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 forgot on that list of uh, yeah, probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about what about closer to home right here? Indeed. So it is a global phenomenon for sure, and yeah. and we can talk about the the roots of that. But I I would posit, and you can hold me to this, that Germany will be the last European country to to succumb to populism on a on a large scale. And, and uh, I mean, there will always be that, that hardcore. Um, and, and certainly Merkel has given them a focus. And by the way, they are mostly from her own region, which is particularly bitter for her. They're yeah. from the East because the, 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 two, uh, the two Germanys uh, and the fusion of the two East and West has, has been imperfect. The two Germanys, have a di different self image. The East never went through the process of, 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 of facing and, and, and learning from its own history because it, it created this myth of we are the good Germans, we were the anti-fascist Germans, the Nazis were in the West. So they never went through that, that, that rigorous uh, re uh, re rigorous confrontation with their own history that West Germany went through. And therefore they don't think they owe the world uh, the, the sort of atonement and redemption. That's very much a fabric of West Germany. And this is a problem. And I, in, in the chancellor, I do fault Merkel who is an imperfect uh, politician. Uh, we'll, we'll get to, to, both are good and bad sides, but but she uh, underestimated the 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 need of her fellow East Germans to be more acknowledged for their for the their suffering under communism, because she herself is such a supremely um, uh, rational and and obviously a very capable person. She, she didn't understand why everybody else didn't seize the moment when the wall fell in 1989 and roll up, roll up their sleeves the way she did. Uh, and her transformation from, from physicist in, a, in, a, um, in an East Berlin lab to chancellor of the world has been, well, nothing short of jaw dropping, but um, most, most East Germans <laughs> could not follow anything nearly uh, that dramatic a transformation, particularly those of a certain generation. And they are the ones who have, who have, have really succumbed to the, to the seduction of populism uh, because they don't think they have anything to, to, to uh, atone for in their history. And Merkel on, on her side has made Germany's debt to the Jews, a permanent and foundational pillar of, of uh, Germans' uh, raison d'etre or Staatsraison, as you would say in German. So you see, you have these two separate national narratives and she didn't heed uh, sufficiently. She didn't do enough, uh, she didn't pay enough attention to the discontent in the East and she, it's not the economy stupid because the economy, it's, it's more about pay attention to us 
I mean, we have a similar situation here in our country too. It's, it's about people needing to be heard and to be, to be uh, you know, brought into, brought into um, uh, the conversation. And, and she just thought, you know, we're all, we're all East Germans who are very uh, fortunate that we get a second chance now. And, um, and, and she was, she, she overestimated uh, the, the, the rational element in human decision making because she's so hyper rational. Yeah, in, in the book, you, you mentioned, uh, use the word debt, um, which brings me to the question about Greece and, and Germany. And I remember being in Germany at the time and even very liberal Germans seem to take a very hard line on the question of, you know, kind of bailing out, you know, the people who hadn't done the right thing. So, um, you know, at least in their own minds, they felt that they they didn't owe a debt to anybody else in the EU who had not done so well. So yeah. how do you kind of come down in the book about um, kind of her decision making around that? And what I, she just I, was, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I um, you know, the, the whole um, uh, Eurozone crisis that started in, in 2008 really revealed um, some weaknesses in her leadership and, and a kind of a, um, an un, unattractive uh, uh, puritanical policy toward, toward the, the, the southern rim of, of Europe that, that couldn't match uh, Germany's productivity and Germany's uh, culture of, of savings and austerity and so on. And, and um, her, her mantra of austerity didn't play very well um, in, in countries that were hurting. And, and, and populations that, that, that were suffering, not a result of, of their own spendthrift uh, ways, but because, of, because their governments lie. And because the banks, including many American banks, as we know, um, you know sold them a bill of goods. And, and, um, but it, ultimately she, she, um, she, she sponsored several uh, bailouts of, of, of Greece and the other uh, Southern Rim countries. But but she lost the PR war there. She, but she learned from that. And uh, you know Merkel is 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 uh, non dogmatic, non ideological, and is constantly learning from her mistakes because she is not burdened by. Uh, well, first of all, for her politics is not a. a a, a, a battle for attention, or 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 uh, or, or for um, uh, it's not a personal uh, identity sport. It's it's about getting the job done, and so she's constantly course correcting. And so and so she did with the eurozone crisis, and and just last year, when in uh, in the face of COVID, um, again there were European countries, uh, members of the EU, who were uh, far more impacted um, economically than, than Germany. She and with, with, uh, with Macron um, came through with a plan to form a collective, uh, collective response to those countries. So not giving, not, not, um, giving them debts um, uh, to be repaid, but, but outright grants. So the opposite of austerity, the opposite. So um, I, I, I have to admit, Peter, um, and you probably already know this about me, that, that finance is not my absolute strong suit. But, but of course, I had, to, I had to do a lot of uh, research to, to uh, wrap my head around um, the Eurozone meltdown. But I, I, I will admit it was not my favorite chapter. Um, there were many other things about Merkel um, who, that, that I found uh, really um, both um, inspiring and, uh, and fascinating and unexpected. Um, and the portrait that emerges, I hope you'll agree, um, uh, is, is not the portrait that one expects. Well, you mentioned the word austerity and, and the, you know, a big part of the beginning of the book, and this is all stuff I had absolutely no idea about, is you know, her father, the pastor who 
seemed like a very kind of closed in. Is talk the, about austerity. Yeah, yeah, talk about austerity and this sort of Lutheran, uh, you know, very hardcore Protestant, and then East Germany, and then the you know rent controlled apartment with the four rooms that she yeah. continues to live in. So this is part of her character. Um, where did it come from? What was the influence of her father? One of the things you say in the book is there's almost nothing known about him except he made an accommodation with the East German government, which is, yes. uh, you know. Uh, no. I think I think that that even even some Germans were shocked in, in my book to discover to what extent he was known as uh, as as the red pastor. Um, but but be, even before that, he took his family from the security of West Germany to East, which was already Soviet occupied, uh, yeah. to preach the word of the Lord. Which uh, okay, so he was a zealous Lutheran, but that that meant that the whole family um, was was uh, was a part of part of of, of a captive uh, society. And once well, the wall to, came by up, the way, the book is very well written, and you describe it as a prison state, which I thought was kind of a, a very efficient way of explaining. Well, because Merkel herself call, refers to it as a lager, which uh, which in German generally refers to a concentration camp, because she herself became a victim of the Stasi state, the Stasi being the, the East German secret police, even more efficient than the KGB. Um, you know, from an early age, and this is in addition to being a pastor's daughter, so her Lutheran foundation and her Lutheran need to serve, which is one of the core um, uh, elements of, of, of the book, um, there, there, there's um, also this, this 35 years that she was um, a captive of a, of a surveillance state and learned to keep her own counsel, to be deeply suspicious of most people, uh, because her lab partner in in East in her East uh, Berlin uh, lab was turned out to be someone she trusted, befriended, turned out to be a full time informer on her, and found um, nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Well, she did well have I mean, nothing. but like, he, I mean, yeah. I think you say in the book that it was like it was pretty thin pickings. It was thin pickings, but but uh, but it's kind of, it was kind of reassuring to me to know that 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 you know she was having affairs. The uh, oh yeah, general duration <laughs> was six weeks, but <laughs> but you know she's a she's not a, she's not a pure she's not a prude. She is, um, you know, what I I I I said earlier that the portrait that emerges is not of a is not what you expect. Because, because in fact, she's emotional. I've twice seen her uh, weep. Um, once at a, at a memorial for, uh, at Verdun uh, for uh, uh, the 70th, I, I believe it was the 70th uh, memorial for the, of the Battle of Verdun. And she, she looked out at a, at a, at a kind of a, a endless sea of, of white crosses and her eyes filled. Um, young men who had fought Germans and French, uh, young men who had sh fought over, you know, uh, inches of territory, um, and and she's very funny. She does a, an incredible um, send up of, of Putin to her staff. As, uh, as one way that she that she relieves the stress of dealing with with. She she was not blessed in the cast of characters that she had to deal with for 16 years. And Putin, of course, was prime among them. Her longest dysfunctional marriage was with Putin. Um, and, and basically she was, the only, um, she was the only leader that Putin respects and, and has time for. And they literally speak each other's languages. Uh, yeah, she, you, you say in the book that she spent hundreds and hundreds of hours with him. And I, I didn't realize that he was a fluent German speaker. Yes. And, yes. and of course I, yeah, you know, it's not a surprise she speaks Russian pretty well because she grew up in the GDR. Exactly, but, exactly. But then I, there's a great scene in the book where he sort of gets his dog to kind of he he understands that she doesn't like dogs and he sort of sicks her very, dog. 
and you know was constantly uh, trying to shake her composure and and never succeeded. Much much to his frustration, unleashing the dog was one. Uh, submitting her to the KGB uh, eye staring contest where she she didn't blink. Always arriving late to their meetings, and it, and 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 when she. Uh, looks askance, he said, well, this is just the way we are. And then she would say, well, Vladimir, it's not the way we are. Uh, and, uh, but, 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 but after these meetings, she, she does a, uh, a great imitation of him for, for her staff as, as uh, uh, stress uh, relief. But, but, you know, so, so among her, her uh, sort of uh, lesser known qualities um, is is uh, is not only the, the the humor and the emotion, but also um, calculation. And when necessary, um, she can be very ruthless. As Helmut Kohl found out to his peril, Helmut Kohl, as you well know, the Titanic figure in germ of, uh, of unification politics who was her mentor and really launched her political career, but got into some hot water over a kickback scandal, but nobody else in the, in the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, had the courage to tell him, Helmut, for the greater good of the party and the nation, it's time to go. She did, she wrote a, 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 an extraordinary um, opinion piece in, in uh, the, the in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, read by everybody, which ended Kohl's career mm. and cleared passage of Merkel to the chancellery, the first woman chancellor in a country that uniquely in Europe never even had a queen. So, and many other examples of, of men who underestimated her in a way, the same way I did because of her affect, which is deliberately don't focus on me, uh, focus on what I get done. And, you know, I, I, I would wish that more politicians without, you know, naming names would focus on us the way she has focused on Germany. Um, so it's, she never identified her position as chancellor with, with herself. She was, for her, it was, a job she had to fulfill and 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 therefore um leaving the chancellery as she's now doing will not be this this uh, you know trauma for her because she never left her rent control apartment in the heart of berlin she's she's going uh, right back there and uh and she nor did she ever stop cooking for herself or her husband or doing her own groceries so 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 she never uh you know wrapped herself in the in the um the mantle of uh of power it's hard to imagine her you know in a big chateau or in a uh, or god forbid on a yacht <laughs> you know she's just <laughs> she she's she's still the pastor's daughter but that doesn't mean that she's that she's humorless or that or or unemotional so kind of a related question from the audience um has the chancellor been scandal free and i want to add to that you have a scene in the book about the nord pipeline uh which has been very controversial in fact trump uh, kind of gave her a hard time about it at, at one point he said that germany was uh owned by russia which is kind of an extraordinary thing to say to her and it was in the context of this discussion around the gas pipeline. So what is that gas, gas pipeline? Why is it controversial? Yeah. Did she make the right choice? Well, you know, it's particularly ironic for Trump to be uh, saying that, that she was beholden. <laughs> cool to, projection. To, to, to Russia. She's the opposite. She, she, her approach to Putin is the opposite of Trump's, where Trump was, was you know, tried to, to show some distance and even toughness in, in um, in uh, in front of the cameras uh, with Putin, and then then of course we now know we have chapter and verse of how when when it was just the two of them, uh, Putin and Trump, he would say you know forget it this is all for this is all for the press, whereas Merkel would be just the opposite very polite she she doesn't like to to uh, she doesn't engage in name calling. 
or uh, um, uh, criticizing uh, dictators uh, for public show. She saves that for for when she's with them. I mean, the same with with uh, with the Chinese leadership. She has cultivated the Chinese leadership since 2005. She's made more trips to Beijing than any other world leader, which is uh, um, remarkable that in 2005, she already saw that China was the looming giant and had to be engaged. But, but to answer your question, Peter, about the uh, Nord Stream. So um, she considers herself, first of all, chancellor of Germany. Uh, Germany is uh, a country that, that does need uh, Russian uh, fuel energy. And um, that is her first concern. She is fully aware um, of um, Germany's history, Germany's susceptibility to when times are tough uh, to take the wrong course. Uh, we don't have to look too far. We just look to 19, the 1930s to what happens when, when, uh, when Germans are in strained economic uh, circumstances. She's fully aware of that. So that's her, uh, the German car um, industry, as you well know, is, is, uh, is, is very important to the, to the health of its economy and, and depends on the Chinese market um, as well as the Russian. Um, so these are one of her mantras is uh, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. So she, she calculates, she's not a spontaneous politician. She, she, um, she has explained that she, she works from the desired goal and works her way background. How do I get to that goal? So she, uh, politics for her is, is, is something that has to be carefully calculated and she does not think that you can either that you can that that you have the luxury of 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 not dealing with people who are unsavory or or uh, not your uh, kind of people she deals with the world as it is not as not as she would like it to be I don't think that that Angela Merkel believes that the the arc of a moral universe bends toward justice um, she is very much, um, I wouldn't say she's a Kissingerian real politician, uh, but, but she, I would describe her as a, um, as a determined optimist, somebody who thinks that, that, that for example, the, the image of Sisyphus pushing that rock up the mountain only to have it roll back. She doesn't think that's a, a, a pessimistic image. That is how she considers her own work. It's and and again, I trace it to her Lutheran, uh, to her Lutheran roots of you know good works require daily uh, effort um, because because people are what they are imperfect and and she's 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 really been the embodiment of of that sort of, how shall I put it, practical, uh, practical idealism, which has really served not only Germany well, but, but the world well, that, you know, in an age of, of, of uh, fevered rhetoric and easy, easy answers, uh, her, her kind of, of moderation and, and staying at the negotiating table as she frequently does, if there's the possibility of an inch of compromise, you know, she just always thinks that 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 there's there's got to be a, 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 a there's got to be a deal uh, to be found, um, it, and it's, yeah. it's you, not you, about you know her needing to score. You you say that she doesn't believe in the um, the arc of the universe bending towards justice, which of course um, President Obama would use that phrase quite a lot, quoting Dr. King. Um, and, it, and one of the interesting things in the book is you, you quote Ben Rhodes, I, I'm paraphrasing, but like, you know, Obama's feelings towards Merkel were really ones of love, which is a pretty yes. strong feeling. So what was, 
what was the nature of their relationship and 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 what did it achieve or or you know did it it's one thing to like somebody else and to admire them but what are they were they able to get things done i, I guess the iran nuclear deal is one of them um but what do you well, it was a rocky relationship, Obama and, and Merkel at the outset, because she's suspicious of people um, who, are, who, who are gifted uh, public speakers. She herself is, is singularly un, uh, untalented in that, in that realm. Um, and she thought he was all rhetoric. Um, and he got off to a bad start with her because he asked to um, give uh, a speech at the Brandenburg Gate, um, you know, the, the most iconic uh, German um, uh, backdrop even before he was elected. So she <laughs> thought, well, that's a bit presumptuous. And then, of course, he was he was uh, found to have been tapping her cell phone, which right. for somebody which for somebody who, who you know, grew up in the, in the secret police state was, you can only imagine the trauma of that. Not that, not that she, he got anything from, from those. Yeah, I, one of the questions I wanted to ask is I was like, do you think Obama was actually aware that this was happening? I mean, you know, a lot of things happen. It's not like, you know, did he know this or was he personally well, embarrassed? It happened, it happened on his watch, put it yeah. that way. So, you know, the buck stops here. Yeah. And, and that created, in the words of, um, of Obama's ambassador to Berlin, John Emerson, he, he, he told me it, it created a wasted year between Berlin and Washington. Yeah. Um, uh, for what? Um, so, so, you know, rocky beginnings. But then uh, when, when Putin made his move, um, as um, uh, a aggressor in uh, Ukraine, Crimea, moving actually moving um, his his forces uh, into Crimea, and of course lying through his teeth about you know you remember the little green men who you know the uh, Russian Russian militia and their sympathizers who wore green uniforms without any insignia and and was constantly lying about you know how these are just local forces etc. Obama handed that crisis, which was a huge crisis because it was the first time since the Second World War, discounting the Balkan Wars, which were more internal, um, that, that an army moved against a, a neighbor um, and, and, you know, was in defiance of all the, the, the guardrails, all the uh, things erected in the uh, wake of World War II to prevent such aggression. Obama handed that off to Merkel, who, who, who then really became the chancellor of the West, I would say. And, and not only did she do a masterful job of negotiating for a ceasefire, he has not progressed. I mean, it's, a, it's not that that, that uh, crisis is, is, is over and done, but, but, uh, but it, it, it's a it's at a, it's at a, how shall I put it, low level of, of uh, hostility there. But then she, she got the, um, the, uh, the European Union to, to unify in imposing sanctions that really had bite um, against Russia to discourage future such. And it has, I mean, it, it, it's worked. And, and that, was, that was Merkel. And she never wanted Peter to be to be the leader of the West, or to be the, you know, even the 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 leader of Europe, um, it was kind of thrust upon her. And whenever she negotiated with Putin, she would always take, for example, uh, Hollande, or or later or later Sarkozy. Um, you know, she would always no Sarkozy preceded Hollande. Uh, she would always take someone else with her for uh, you know the, the, her, her her French counterpart. Um, because she didn't want Germany to be seen as as the top dog. She wants Germany to be to be strong, but but as a European power, not as the leader of Europe. Because she's well aware of how how re, how you know people have memories and how recently uh, Germans were 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 feared and loathed. And of course, she encountered that uh, during the the um, Eurozone crisis. Um, which we which we touched on when she finally did go to Athens and saw herself burnt 
in effigy and with a Hitler mustache and, you know, all those old tropes uh, surfaced again. So she doesn't, she, she doesn't want to go there. So, so that, that is, is um, also part of her legacy is that Germany cannot uh, be a, a, a strong uh, military power. Um, there's been a lot of pressure on Germany to, you know, beef up its armed forces. She's resisted that. She still, even now, wants Germany to be well embedded, not only in Europe, but in NATO, and still looks to Washington, even now, um, as the guarantor of, uh, of German security. But no longer this chancellor who was the most pro-American uh, chancellor in, in, in history. I don't think that's too much of an exaggeration. Um, uh, has, been, has been shaken to her core, not only by Trump's election, which she early on attributed to America's sort of Byzantine electoral system, but even now, um, where you know Trump was defeated by Biden, but for her it's deeply disturbing that Trump hasn't faded. His power is still immense, and the power of the big lie, which she, as a student of history and a student of German history, um, knows that the big lie. Can, can have terrible consequences because it's really how Hitler uh, got to the Reichstag, the big lie yeah. of, 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 of Germany having been stabbed in the back by the communists and the Jews. And so she's, I think, quite worried about um, where America is heading. And therefore, among her uh, final acts um, as, as chancellor, of, of Europe, <laughs> which she all but officially was, uh, she pushed through a deal, a trade deal with China, which the Biden administration very early in office uh, asked her not to do without Washington. Wait and we'll be there and we'll do it together. Well, no, she, she sent a signal to Washington that you are no longer sitting at the head of the table. You are no longer the CEO of the of the West. Uh, we we want to be part of uh, NATO, of course. We need you. We need your arms. We don't want to be are arming ourselves, but we're going to look out whenever possible for our own interests. Because frankly, I'm putting I'm interpreting her her words because she would never explain it this way. Uh, frankly you're not as trustworthy as, uh, as we had anticipated. And she did have a very, I would say almost a romantic uh, view of, of America as a lot of people behind the Iron Curtain. I grew up there myself as a lot of people did. And that, that was shattered by, um, by Trump. Let's go back the, to the immigration decision. I mean, yes, it had this political impact, and I think you're suggesting that it, the political impact may not be as big as, 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 as oh. some people may have anticipated. But it seems to me, knowing very little about the subject, but uh, the you know, given the scale of the size of immigration, I mean, for a country that's what sixty million, mm -hmm. I think you know, during the Vietnam War, I think the United States took you know a couple hundred thousand boat people and a obviously a much bigger population, much bigger country, but how has the integration gone of, the, of this new group of immigrants? Good, bad, well, and different? Yeah. I, I, I'm really glad you, you came back to that because the fact is that we now have a template uh, in how to assimilate uh, uh, such a huge um, mass of, 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 of people coming from a, a, a dramatically different culture and, and, and faith. Um, namely the Middle East, and, that, and, and they have been assimilated. And there, there is a program set in place for their assimilation, and they're not a, they, they are dispersed around the country. So, so you, you've, they've avoided 
you know, the, 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 these concentrations of, of immigrant populations on the, on the, on the rim of, of German cities that, that you find in, in, uh, in France, for example, with their population uh, and in, in Great Britain and elsewhere. So they've been, they've been quite precise in dispersing them and, and uh, things are expected of, of immigrants. They have to learn German and there are these work training programs that, that, um, have have been have worked very well, and many of many of these um, refugees coming from fleeing the the Syrian civil war as well as the Afghan and Iraqi ones are are uh, are are middle class and and bring a great deal uh, to Germany, which has a serious demographic problem. Well, that's and, what I was going. That's what I was going to ask you because I mean. You know, look at Japan, or look, you know, which basically has no immigration and uh, this very graying population. I mean, you know, it's not an accident. I think they've had no economic growth for since 1990. Yeah. Or look at Italy, yeah. which is essentially going out of business. So, I mean, Angela Merkel is clearly she's a physicist by training. She does math. <laughs> she understands. So, yes. was this part of her calculation as well? Yes, but again, I fault her for not sufficiently um, explaining that aspect because, again, because because she she she's she's so rational and she expects people to get what she gets, <laughs> and she never right. explained that this is really good for us, folks, yeah. that we need uh, an infusion of of uh, uh, of youth and and uh, we you know our population is is uh, is declining. And, but the fact is that it has worked, that it is a back burner issue now. And, uh, you know, uh, Henry Kissinger, who is her, her old friend and uh, sometime mentor, when, um, when she told him that she was gonna do this, she, she, she said, uh, uh, Kissinger said to Merkel, to allow one refugee into the country is, an, is a humanitarian act to allow a million is to destroy a civilization. And her answer very, you know, she's, she's not argumentative. She's, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't answer passion or bombast with passion and bombast. She said, I had no choice. And in fact, by her lights, this was, this was the morally right thing to do. And it was, I, I've spoken to the fact that she's a calculating politician, which indeed she is, but she also has a core of, of uh, morality that, that was uh, crucial in the refugee um, situation because actually she herself is a refugee. She never left her country, but her country left her, her country kind of East Germany vanished under her, which means that she had to learn a whole new way of being and, and a whole, take on a whole new identity. And she well understands that refugees never leave home because they want to, and that you never get over the fact of having to leave all that is yours and familiar. She, she has a profound understanding of that. And I think all of that, I, I describe in the chancellor, the, the, the dramatic and specific encounter that she had with a, with a young refugee that, uh, that kind of broke through to her and, and um, was, was behind this, 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 decision, this extraordinary decision, which really I cannot overemphasize what, what a courageous decision that was. It wasn't just Kissinger who said, you're gonna destroy Germany. It was a lot of other people, but it didn't happen. Yeah. We have a couple of questions, which are versions of what it, what's next for, for Angela Merkel. Well, um, I think uh, having, having studied her uh, for however many years, that she will make herself scarce in Berlin. She will let her successor uh, establish himself. Uh, she will probably spend a lot of time in her um, Brandenburg, very modest Brandenburg cottage. She will be free for the first time in her life. She was, she was unfree in the, in the large concentration camp, which was East, East Germany for 35 years. And obviously 16 years as chancellor, 
she was not free. So I think she's going to, with her scientists' uh, curiosity, observe how she reacts and behaves with, with freedom, you know, not having uh, a schedule published every day and distributed, not having, uh, you know, a follow car go with her to the grocery store. Um, and, and see what that feels and tastes like, that, that level of freedom. Um, and then if she discovers that she misses having a seat at the table, uh, I think she will have ample opportunity uh, to, uh, to return, but not, not to a job. I mean, what, what sort of job would tempt someone who's been chancellor of Germany for 16 years? However, she has an incomplete agenda item and that is climate change. Mm. That was high on her priority list, but she never fulfilled it because her 16 years have been one rolling crisis. And you know she didn't choose the migration crisis or the or or the um, economic meltdown of two thousand eight or the election of Donald Trump, or or the or Putin's invasion of uh, of uh, Crimea, but uh, those were all and many other things um, all on her watch. So this two years ago she just she said in her New Year's Eve speech that climate was going to be uh, her, 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 her next big agenda item. And you know what happened two years ago, COVID. And then right. she became, she be, you know, that was her final crisis and that, that, um, that has occupied her, her final two years. And by the way, she's done, she's done uh, probably better than almost any other head of state, because as you said, she, she's comfortable with numbers. She can project the, the, the course of a disease by, by doing the numbers. I would wish, you know, having studied her example that more scientists would go into politics, but, uh, but very few scientists of course have, have her, her personal, uh, the, her other attributes, which, which we've talked about. Um, in the, in, in the few minutes we have left, uh, this is a great question and it is in a way the most obvious question. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> what do you think has been the biggest challenge for her as a woman in a leadership role and what can others learn from her abilities? Oh, and you know, I'm really glad that that's, that's uh, what we're closing on because I really believe that, that her, her, her greatest legacy is putting to rest permanently the capacity of a woman to lead, not in spite of being a woman, but because she's a woman, because she was she had the ability to park her ego in a way to get the deal done, to get the job done that I've never seen, I must confess, uh, any male politician uh, deliver that. So I, I, I think her biggest challenge, of course, was that men, Always treated her with sanctimony, and um, and and, but she turned that to her advantage because in underestimating her, um, they they spelled their own doom because she she uh, she always surprised them because she is tough and because she is so smart and you know I I watched her a little bit she she uh, she's allowed me in her orbit to observe and uh and she does not um you know my my uh late husband richard holbrook was a great negotiator and 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 used uh i was with him in in, in dayton and i i observed uh you know his combination of of charm and threats and and uh you know just force of person of course uh, you know, he had a plan too. He wasn't just using charm and threats, but but Merkel has a different technique, and and hers is just an absolute mastery of detail that that her her uh, opposite numbers can never match <laughs> because because she's very retentive. I would say she has a photographic memory. And, um, and, and she just, you know, you can't, 
you can't BS with her because she she knows she knows the 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 truth she knows the numbers she knows she knows you know when Putin says oh I didn't I I, I you know I that village is safe from my reach she will say because she she knew every tree in that village uh, actually three of your guys just took that tree or, you know I mean I'm making up an example but that level that mastery of uh, of of facts and detail it it um I, I i i would i would hope that we would see uh others others copy that it's um it's it's, it's been remarkable and and she really she really i mean first of all she's just a remarkable role model for for women but i think remarkable a, a great role model for anybody who, who uh, is interested in, in, in leadership, not only how to get power, but how to keep it. 16 years, that's pretty. And, and also exercise it for the public good, which is after all. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, thank you, Peter. Yes, I should have led with that. Yes, for the public good. Yes, yes, not, it's not, again, the, the ego removed. And it's not, yeah. like the, it's not like she doesn't have an ego. You, she has a very robust ego and she's very self-confident. I mean, she was always the, the best in every class, but she keeps that to herself. She, it's amazing how much you can get done if you don't take credit for it. Speaking of mastery of facts and detail, <laughs> the amazing new book with, that has got all these amazing new reviews, The Chancellor uh, by Caddy Martin. Go out and buy it. Uh, and we're going to wrap the program uh, and I'm going to turn it back to Alan at Politics and Prose. Thank you, Peter. It was so much fun talking thank to you. Thank you, Patty. Thank and thanks, you. everybody. For, thank you to the 130 people who tuned in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And Politics and Prose, you're the best. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you, Cody. Thank you so much. And Peter, for joining in this conversation, celebrating the release of the Chancellor. Um, and... Kadi will be coming in tomorrow to sign books. So please, yes, please do come request, in. Yeah, <laughs> request a signed book. And yeah. um, I want to thank you all for joining us. It's your patronage that is enabling us to keep events like this, you know, continuing, just going. Thank you, Kadi. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you all for joining us. Um, My pleasure. And, really. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, um, Hi, Kadi. Good Bye, luck Peter. with uh, the rest of your thank events you. for this. Yes, absolutely. Okay.